Psalms 26, verse number four. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. Proverbs 11, verse number nine. The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. Romans chapter 9, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse number 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2 talks about how we are not to speak lies and hypocrisy, having our own conscience seared with a hot iron. James chapter 3, verse number 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 1 teaches us that we are to lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Our sermon tonight is titled, Hypocrites in the Church. The scriptures, both old and new, say quite a bit about how we are to be authentic, genuine children of God and to avoid this double standard way of life. Dictionary.com defines hypocrite as the following. A person who pretends to have virtues, moral or religious beliefs, principles, etc., that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions belie stated beliefs. The hypocrite, and we all know what hypocrites are, but the hypocrite sets a standard for everyone else and then another standard for himself. The hypocrite makes demands on others that he has no intentions of fulfilling in his own life. The hypocrite exempts himself from any real genuine pursuit of faithfulness and holiness. The hypocrite exempts himself from the demands of true discipleship. And secretly, maybe not so much, but the hypocrite assumes that he or she is more important than others, that he or she is superior to everyone else. And we want to make sure that we by no means fall into this category of being a hypocrite. We want to make sure that the things that we believe are matched by the things that we do. That we don't want to say one thing and do another. That we don't want to preach one thing but practice another. We want to make sure that as we believe, we are also living as well. And all of us at times, we go back and forth in our faith. And there is at times a challenge and an inconsistency in what we say and what we believe and, and what we do. But the scripture is pointing out that hypocrisy is more than just the, the faithful Christian who stumbles on occasion. For those of us who are striving to live faithful and fall short, we can be mindful and comforted to know that as we walk in the light, that we will have fellowship with Jesus. And so anytime we as Christians stumble or sin, that doesn't mean we automatically become a hypocrite. Rather, if we embrace a lifestyle in which we intentionally and on purpose over the course of time create an image that we are living one way, but in reality we're living and doing a whole other different thing, then that is what hypocrisy is all about. Tonight, we're going to spend just about all of our time in the Gospel of Matthew. Eventually, we're going to land in the second half of chapter 23. But I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, it's a very familiar passage to you. And chap verses 3 through 12 talk about eight opportunities we have to be blessed. 
And the scriptures, these are known as the Beatitudes. They teach us how to live a genuine, authentic Christian life. If we want to make sure we stay away from hypocrisy, if we want to make sure we stay true to our faith, then we need to, as Jesus says in verse 3 of Matthew 5, Bless are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are, shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus is putting forth for us the way that we are to live our lives. If we live, if we believe and do these beatitudes, then not only will we look real good on the outside, but we'll look real good on the inside. And the best way to prevent living a hypocritical life is to model our lives out of these beatitudes and following to our very best ability than doing exactly what Jesus says to do. But it wasn't long after Jesus taught on the Beatitudes that he quickly reminded the people that if you do not follow my teachings, including these Beatitudes, you can very easily slip into a life of hypocrisy. The Gospel of Matthew, more so than any other book in the New Testament, warns us about the problem and the, and the sin of hypocrisy. Notice with me, and we're going to swiftly go through these verses. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Surely, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse number 5 of Matthew 6, Jesus says, And when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse 16 of Matthew 6, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with the sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. Matthew 7, verse number 5, hypocrite, Jesus says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew chapter 15, verse number 7, Jesus says this, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. And he goes on and talks about how in vain they worshipped him, teaching, verse 9, the commandments and the doctrines of men. Matthew 16, verse number 3, Jesus talks about in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And Matthew chapter 22, verse number 18, Jesus says this. He's perceiving their wickedness, and he says, why do you test me, you hypocrites? It's a quick survey leading up to chapter number 23 in which Jesus is clearly seeking his followers to be truly 
disciples of his. Jesus' desire for us is to look real good on the outside, but to look real good on the inside as well. As we mentioned this morning, the scribes and the Pharisees, they felt as if the world revolved around them, that everyone should bow down to them. And they weren't as much as they weren't as much interested in striving to please Jesus as much as they were others being pleased with them and giving them the accolades and the attention. I'd like to notice with you Matthew chapter number 23 and verse number 13. I'm not going to read every single one of these verses, but I'd like for you to follow along and, and maybe reading as I, I talk a little bit to, to get acclimated. And, and what you'll notice in this text from Matthew 23, from verses 13 through the end of the chapter is about seven or eight woes, just depending on what translation you use. But Jesus says seven or eight times, woe to you. And what is interesting is if you compare and contrast these eight statements that Jesus is making, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, each of them just about identically is the exact opposite of those beatitude statements in Matthew 5. I challenge you to, to maybe study later Matthew 5, 3 through 12, and each of those blessed statements compared to the seven or eight woe to you statements in Matthew 23, and you'll know pretty much and see that they pretty much are exactly the opposite. In other words, as we pursue the beatitudes, we'll stay out of hypocrisy. But if we pursue hypocrisy, then there's no way that we can have those beatitudes in our lives. First of all, in Matthew 23, verse number 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because what they were doing was shutting the door to the kingdom. Jesus desires for his kingdom doors to be open. But these scribes and Pharisees were trying to shut the door to other folks, not wanting them to enter in. Secondly, in verse number 14, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. They were taking advantage of the widows, the most vulnerable of society. And they had a reputation for these long-winded prayers. And what Jesus wants us to know is it's not the quantity of words in our prayers, it's the quality of words. And that quality is not based upon how well we sound. The quality is based upon what is going on in our hearts as we pray to the Lord. In verses 16 through 22, Jesus says again, woe to you, you blind guides. And, and in these verses, he's, Jesus is talking and addressing this idea of the scribes and Pharisees wanting to bind oaths on people that are absolutely not essential to their spiritual well-being. A familiar one in verses 23 through 24, this is number five. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for they were neglecting the weightier matters of the law. They were very intently focused on these lesser items and they were neglecting justice and mercy and faith. Verses 25 and 26 is number six, this other woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because what they were trying to do was make this image when, which the outside was really, really clean, yet the inside was dirty. The inside was filled with extortion and self-indulgence. Number seven, verses 27 through 28, Jesus talks about, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, 
you hypocrites. And he's talking about these tombs and, and these monuments. And he's showing that on the outside of these tombs and monuments, things looked real good. And, and it, it was a wonderful sight to behold. But we know what's on the inside of tombs and monuments is nothing but decaying bones and, and, and something that, of course, does not look very good to the eye. Finally, the eighth, beginning in verse number 29, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And he goes on and he's addressing the, the descendants of the murderers of the prophets. And he has some very explicit language for them. And verse number 33, Jesus says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Brood of vipers, have, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Being an authentic, genuine child of God is eternally important. We cannot live this life of hypocrisy in which we appear to others that we're living faithfully, yet on the inside we are far from it. Jesus goes on in Matthew 23 and verse 34 and says, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of the righteous Abel, the very first shedding of blood that we have recorded in Scripture, to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechariah, the last recorded blood shed in the Old Testament times, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. As we strive to live faithful to God, we want to pursue the Beatitudes and stay away from hypocrisy. And we want to make sure that our lives are nowhere near like these scribes and Pharisees. I would venture to say that all of us here tonight are genuinely striving to live the Christian life. That you're here and you're trying to do the best that you can, but you may very well know of folks close to you who would say something to the effect of, and we've all heard this line before, I'm not going back to that church because it's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. How many of you heard so, say someone, someone say something like that? Well, the thing is, they're absolutely right. The church is full of hypocrites in the sense of folks who have fallen back into sin and, and are not doing what they need to do. But what we need to understand is that there's hypocrites at work. There's hypocrites at school. There's hypocrites at the gym. There's hypocrites at the park. There's hypocrites at the stadium. There's hypocrites everywhere we go. And yes, there are hypocrites in the church, but that shouldn't keep us from being a part of the Lord's body. It is true, people do come to church with impure motives, and they smile at you even if they really don't like you. Some have said that some will love you to your face, but hate you behind your back. There are Christians who would fight very intently about the inspiration of the scripture, yet very rarely read the Bible themselves on a regular basis. There are some who may defend the importance of the church and the, all the identifying characteristics and markers of the church, but spend much of their time gossiping and slandering the members of the church. But those who don't come to church because of hypocrites act as if God has rounded up all the hypocrites and, and put them in the church building and the rest of the world is just, we have all of these pure motives. 
No, of course that's not the case. But the reality is, I would much rather be a part of a group in part of the Lord's church and be with hypocrites in the church than spend all of my time with hypocrites in the world. Two writers uh, were writing a text, Josh McDowell and Don Stewart, and they say that Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians have acted throughout history and are acting today. That's the excuse a lot of people say for not wanting to be in the church is because it's all full of hypocrites. Well, we cannot base our decision to be faithful to God based upon what others are doing around us. Christianity, these writers say, stands or falls on the person of Jesus. And Jesus, of course, was not a hypocrite. He lived consistently with what he taught. And at the end of his life, he challenged those who had lived with him night and day. Since Christianity depends on Jesus, it is incorrect to try to invalidate the Christian faith by pointing to horrible things done in the name of Christianity. Someone will say, well, yeah, the church is full of hypocrites or, or the church, there's members who, who sin all of the time and, and they're far from perfect. And yes, that's absolutely right. There's no need to argue the point that there are folks who do not follow Christianity to its fullest extent. However, the bottom line is this. We know, as Jesus emphasized in verse 33 of Matthew 23, that yes, it is very true that hypocrites are not going to heaven. And it's very, he can't say it any more clear than what he said in Matthew 23, verse 33. However, and this is the whole point of our sermon as we're bringing this in for a close. It is true that yes, hypocrites are not going to heaven. However, we don't want to let we don't want to let a hypocrite or a group of hypocrites keep us out of heaven. You see, that's the problem. Is the folks who say I'm not going to be in the church because it's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, they're staying outside of the church and they're going to be lost as well. I'd rather as many folks have said before, I'd rather spend a few years on this earth going to church with a bunch of hypocrites than to spend all of eternity with them lost, being condemned in hell. Yes, this is a big deal. And yes, we need to live genuine lives. And yes, we want to live out those beatitudes. But let's not ever get discouraged by the naysayers and, and the ones that, that may want to make us feel bad because we're not perfect. We're not perfect, but we are forgiven. And as we strive to live the life that Jesus has called us to live, then we know that we have an ongoing forgiveness of sins. And yes, we are striving to get better and to do better. And we're far from perfect. But we are not hypocrites because we truly, genuinely are striving to live the Christian life. Don't ever let anyone think or make you feel as if you're a hypocrite because they see you do one thing wrong. One thing wrong does not make you a hypocrite. It's an ongoing, continuous, overtime lifestyle in which you're pretending to be someone that... You're not. I'm hoping that tonight's message has been encouraging to you. I'm hoping that we can all stay away from hypocrisy and embrace what Jesus has taught us in the Sermon on the Mount and in all other scriptures as well. And I'm hoping that by our example to others, we can encourage them to become Christians as well. So tonight, as we sing this song of encouragement, I invite each of you to, to consider the message, to consider God's word. The Lord is inviting you to become a Christian and to remain a faithful Christian. If we can help anyone tonight, whether it's repenting of sins and being baptized into Christ, or whether it's to be restored to the Lord, we invite you to come forward right now while together we stand and sing.